Hello and welcome to anyone who has tuned in to our new series of discussions really about um, which we're kind of we've got a working title haven't we which is sort of talking cities uh, cities in in crisis and the focus I suppose of our discussion is Los Angeles um, and of course Norman Klein here is um, our resident expert in um, all things Los Angeles um, and um, what we want to do is just have a, a number what we're planning to do is have a number of kind of short discussions just with uh, different um, subheadings and I think our first our first title was something maybe um, and I'm sort of springing this on you a little bit Norman um, something that you began to talk about last week that obviously is very topical um, that relates to your book on the history of um, the LA uh, police force and the work you're doing around that. You, you'd mentioned last week that you were a little bit kind of frustrated with this reworking of the, the book and the research um, somehow not going away and being somehow protracted and his it's, it's endpoint keeps on changing quite radically in the face of current events, but also maybe more local events. Um, do you think we should start with that? It seems like a good kind of topical Well, it's, it's perfectly legitimate. Today, for example, in Kenosha, Wisconsin, a man uh, spoke to a neighbor to calm down some dispute that was going on and was walking away to meet his three sons. The man was 29 years old. He was wearing flip-flops, a short, and a t-shirt. And he was shot three times by police while he walked away. Uh, what sort of training and justification it is, it's hard to say. Then the city of Kenosha is on fire to some extent, people are upset. And then Trump is gonna use that as an excuse to destroy democracy in the next election and, and, and put, in, put in a kind of um, martial law into, into the United States, which he feels is what his base wants. So that's today's incident. But there have been dozens of them. And as we know, they've, they've, they've sparked worldwide problems. But then the question is, what does this all mean? In the 1990s, in Los Angeles, there was um, uh, an insurrection uh, following, following issues of, of police abuse. There were reforms set up, and reforms were followed through, and a lot of things did seem to suggest that homicides are going down and this and that and so forth. There are all sorts of demographic reasons for it, maybe not the genius of the police or whatever. But what we didn't know, and what is strange about the history of cities in general and the history of our moment in general, is that we were not living in the present. We were living in something on top of the present. Underneath was something else. Uh, what seemed to have been going on was that the, the police were gradually being militarized, not about enforcement, but about being uh, an, a kind of army of occupation. And this process happened during the war on drugs, then the war on crime, and then of course the, the, the various crises in the Middle East, those two crazy wars. And uh, it turns out in stages, while other parts of public sector were cut, no one cut the police because somehow it was connected with our vision of an extended Cold War. So the Cold War and the wars connected with it were attached to cities and then uh, little by little the militarization got worse and worse. The police were given special vans that could f drive right through a house and crush it, something that you use in Baghdad, and they began to use it in the cities. And this militarization issue is so strange. I mean, 20% of the police are also veterans and so on. It caught everyone by surprise because we had this image of where cities were going. We thought, we thought cities were getting blitzier, like London or in particular, because you, you, you live in a part of London that used to be East London. Now it's the center of the universe, London. <laughs> For some people, yeah. Yeah, it's something like that. I mean, even but, the banks um, have decided to move up. What? But how, how did you first, what, what brought you to this subject? Because it was, uh, did it, 
manifest itself as a book of the history of well I, I i co-edited a book years ago in the late 80s with someone who was obsessed with the police and was doing research on it and i when i did history forgetting i felt i had um nothing much to say I, uh, about the police I, I didn't research them i didn't do field work about it and uh, i didn't realize that the police who were in the district where I lived were the most corrupt and dirtiest in American history. They would come to my house and I didn't realize they were part of the group, a man named Perez was at head of them, that was so slimy that all of them were fired. <laughs> many, many went to prison. And I thought I had no, nothing to say. And what I, what I did, I, I, I was interested in the PTSD, the post-traumatic stress syndrome that police were experiencing and dealing with 1992 and so on. I did what I could, but I've never really been a police expert. Um, it's, and it's very difficult to I, understand. I, I remember that when I visited you last, it seems like a long time ago now, maybe it was uh, a year, two years ago, and you were talking about having just done a, a tour of LA police stations. And we oh, were yes, gonna, well, there was... We were going to do one yeah, the, the, yeah. Well, one in particular, there were a few of them. There was one downtown yeah. and one near where I live in Highland Park that have a particular history. One, one and, uh, connected with the Black Dahlia murder, connected with, with uh, Wamba, the policeman who became a novelist on Onion Fields. And uh, the, it's very odd. They both were, were empty and had turned into public sites. One is a museum that no one ever goes to. Another was some kind of public site that didn't quite make sense and people didn't know what to do with it. What to do with it. I mean, the LAPD uh, uh, has a large budget, but it, it's always been rather small relative to the, to the land mass it has to deal with. It's one third the size of New York City's police force, yet the land it has to cover is, is close to twice the size, you know, the, the, the actual territory. Um, it's 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 complicated, but um, in general, it's about a larger subject that is afflicting the United States and caught people by surprise. In stages over the last forty years, at least, the infrastructure issues of the United States—education, public education, roads, uh, freeways, bridges—and and the police have been diminished. And now, with this pandemic, everything is not working. <laughs> And everyone's in the news is surprised, and, and it is Trump's fault for a lot of it. I mean, there's blood on his hands, and he is mentally ill. I understand all that. But, um, I mean, I'm from Brooklyn. He's from Queens. I can tell a crazy guy, guy from, from Queens. Trust me. You know, he's never been from anywhere else but Queens. But, but the when, point is, we, we didn't understand what the – it's so small. The, the garbage collection wasn't the same. This wasn't the same. The, the globalization issue – and something I call a kind of um, feudal condition has diminished the infrastructure. So it isn't just the police, it's all the, the intersection, intersections between the police and people are less. And I would witness all that and we would talk about it a little bit, but um, something very strange connected with the economy and the politics of the United States has actually underdeveloped us to a degree that the police almost treat the United States as if it were a foreign country. Mm. The, the, you can the see that not so much in LA as other cities, but it's there. But and it's racist, racist too, very often. But it's kind of, in, yeah, well, we've seen, <laughs> we've seen that. And in a way, we've seen it partly because of this development with the kind of body cam as well. And yes. you wonder how, how many of these incidents were. so strange, yeah. And the, it takes us back to, to, to the original. It hasn't been that long that police have been wearing body cams, has it? Oh. You, know, you think back, you go back to these films and also thinking about kind of filmic history of uh, how the um, Los Angeles police force are represented. And you think about films like Internal Affairs with Richard Gere or something like that. You can't imagine any of them wearing a body cam, can you? Um, but it, in, in fact, it's not all that long ago, you know? Oh. Uh, and so this this kind of like media mediaization of 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 policing yes. and this imaging of policing is, is very 
Yes. Interesting. I, I know it's very odd. It starts with the with the with, with, with the King Rodney King event. Yeah, exactly. Rodney yeah. Halliday. It wasn't and, a body but, cam, which was which was filmed off maybe people's phones at the time. But yes, it's right. very what strange. We, we have this this almost like a, a, a video art process. It's almost like ha, ha, having a. Uh, a a video, a, a video art device with you at all times, and it's changed the, the intimacy of things. You could see it also in the Iranian Revolution. Um, mm -hmm. They had a big crisis, and information was sent by young people while they're running away to CNN directly. <laughs> it's yeah. sent in images, and of course, the the Arab Spring is like that. So it is very strange. We're seeing things, and we're so we going into the unconscious of our own corruptions more than ever yeah. before and and some really odd incidents there's a there's quite um yeah a highly visited uh well visited video on youtube of uh, a police officer in america i can't remember exactly where it is um arresting or trying to arrest a fbi officer did you see this <laughs> And the, and the conversation is just hilarious. What he's done, he's called him out to some place to have a discussion because he wants to talk about a ticket. And so he's, I think, I get, you get the impression that he wants to threaten him and say, so he kind of takes his ticket back and doesn't prosecute. But um, in the end, the guy says, you know, can you stay in your car and pretty much arrest him um, and contains him in the car. Anyway, the whole thing lasts about an hour and it's just the, one police officer arresting another police officer is, is just hilarious. The, yeah, the I understand. In place. I mean, it's so close to the edge of comedy. I, I'm quite sure 100 years from now, people will laugh their asses off about yeah. what's happened to my country. I, I, as I often say, children, children in the future will dress up as Americans for Halloween. But, there, but this relationship between the local police and the 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 kind of federal case yes uh, that's the right way of putting it um that that is really antagonistic but is kind of also symbolic of something much bigger which is kind yeah. of interesting. There, there are firewalls in the government right that are supposed to keep let's say the sense of liberty intact mm. and in the united states the firewalls are somehow gone yeah. And, it, and in Europe, uh, despite all the misery they've inflicted on themselves and the world, <laughs> the, the firewalls, firewalls are essentially there. So it's, 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 it's very strange were the firewalls never there exactly. It's very, very complicated between the, the, this notion of, of the military and the police. It's a very, very complicated subject, especially when you deal with issues of race. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, the Cold War... Um, extended things, um, but even in Second World War, this maintenance between the militarization and the policing was fairly well delimited. Somehow during the Cold War is when you began to see, right, with McCarthyism and the rest, this, this overflow. Something, something very strange has happened, and I've even been reviewing when it happened elsewhere, going over the 17th century, history of piracy, how piracy was permitted as a legal thing if the pirates are working for you <laughs> and they had international laws about it. I'm beginning to realize that this is not something that never happened before, these distinctions blurring in that way, but they mean something very oh. deep and powerful. It's not just corruption, it's right. systemic, right? And yeah, well, and so that is, uh, the, obviously, as we, as we know, know very well, the, the systemic racism which is interesting in the sense that it shouldn't be surprising because we've seen it played out. You know, I was watching, um, you know, oh, it's not LA, it's New York, but um, uh, uh, Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing. And they, towards the end where they, they take the guy in this chokehold with, you know, and, and, and suffocate him. Um, oh my God. This is kind of already, almost like a, a, a representation of some kind of uh, familiar act from, yeah. from the police force, you know? Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the police abuses are, go, go way back and every city has stories about them. I assume London has them too, but in the US, 
there's a kind of vigilante quality that's sometimes allowed for the police. I mean, they try to make Dirty Harry characters in European films, but somehow no one murders people the way Clint Eastwood and Charles Bronson did. No. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. I mean, uh, uh, Michael Caine tried a few times, and they're very interesting films, but it's different. There's something about this uh, frontier madness that is built into the uh, American character, maybe, if you want to call it that way. And uh, it, it's gotten worse and worse. And now we have an election where the entire future of the country rests on its stopping. It has to finally stop. We have a president who is this week going to officially declare a kind of civil war against the rest of the country. And he's going to declare it day after day. And he's going to hope that there'll be um, eruptions. He wants to have possibly a federal police, a federal agents intimidating voters at the voting pool, at the voting pool, mm. voting booth. And then also, as you, as you probably know, uh, the, in terms of infrastructure, they're destroying the post office as much as possible. Yeah. Um, and yeah. and uh, it, it, it's just yeah, the postal beyond post. surreal. This is a real issue. I mean, hmm. it's not fascism, it's not this, it's not that, but it's something very, very dense, densely packed. Mm. And um, it's very, it, it's just very, very odd. I mean, um, and the polls are sometimes very, very strange. 57% of Republicans in the United States were polled, and they apparently said that they thought it was okay that these people are dying of COVID, and it's not too bad. Yeah. And uh, that's 175,000 people or something. And they think, well, you know, it, he's, Trump said it could have been worse. I said, yeah, you could have dropped an atomic bomb on everybody, that would have been worse. What would be worse, going from door to door with a machine gun? I mean, 175,000 people, and, 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 and I'm beginning to hear stories. It's finally reaching the point where people I know are, are dying. And yeah. before it was kind of strangely obscure, but now my, my um, let's see, the grandmother of my daughter-in-law just died suddenly. She just died in 14 hours. She, she went to have some injury with the foot taken care of, and in the hospital she died, she was old. And, you know, I mean, all these stories are going on and on, and the attitude, so, so it's not just the police, it's not just Trump, right? It's the reinforcing of a certain kind of madness. I don't know if it's true in Europe, but in the United States it's true, in, the, in LA it's not quite the same. LA is kind of the socialist capital of America. <laughs> Way, one of the socialist places. I thought, I thought it was New York. Um, yes, I suppose. Yeah, but well, the, 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 the state of California is 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 very broadly progressive, and upstate yeah. New York is kind of mixed. It's yeah. different. I'll accept that. It doesn't matter. But, but L.A. was the capital of right wing America for a long time. It gave us John Birch, it gave us Nixon, it gave us Reagan, uh, and the idea that now it's. It's, it has lawsuits against Trump and refuses to give ground on anything and this and that and the other thing. It, it's peculiar. So, so there's this whole structural war and then we, it's connected with Black Lives Matter, but it's actually all lives matter. And this, this underneath all of this, at the very bottom of it, at the core of it, is, is inequality and the collapse of jobs. Yeah, the job situation is getting worse, and manufacturing was terrible. It gave us two world wars and destroyed the planet. But it, it gave more job; it provides more work. And this new economy is is just completely unstable as far as labor goes. And um, it's that, every, that's every one of the characteristics of Los Angeles. That's one of the characteristics of Los Angeles, isn't it? That it is. Um, an unstable, unpredictable environment because it has its own uh, geography, the, the kind of idea of being hit, for example, by earthquakes or buildings being built in precarious conditions. You know, um, I, I agree with that. And then the, the wild to a point. Recently. Let, let's look at a few other facts, right? Fact number one, 
that LA was the large, the second or the largest manufacturing hub in the United States, larger than 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 other other places you would think of as being more important, and that LA has 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 the the most important ports in North America. Mm -hmm. LA is wired in, right? And it has an arterial network of about 70 miles around that represents at least 40% of all the goods coming into the United States. And it's, you can feel that as well. So while LA looks like it's disparate and filled with people just looking for an agent to sell their movie, <laughs> It's, it's, it, it, it's, it's very complicated and the, the, the ethnographic issues are very complicated, but in, in a strange way, LA is probably more organized as a single unit than it was even 30 or 40 years ago because of um, the ports. It, it, the, the city is so wired in to, to networks of supply, the supply chains are just extraordinary. And, and I remember it being different. So yes, LA is a kind of archipelago, right? Yeah. Of neighborhoods and, 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 and it has all these wonderful canyons. I live in a canyon. I love being in a canyon. I don't know why, it's just kind of interesting because you're inside and outside. Yeah. <laughs> you look outside and you look inside. And it's, it's like you're in a closet, but it's green. You know, <laughs> uh, and and uh, it, it's fine, but at the same time, there, there's the, the amount of, economic power and the connection to Asia is so strong. I mean, we are the Eastern capital of the Pacific. We're a crossroads city. I call LA the new Byzantium because it has a kind of Constantinopolish quality because of, because of the way it intersects between Latin America and Asia and, and then even Canada, if you want to, you know, or the whole West Coast. It's, it, it, we think of that in places like New York or London, right? Uh, as being but centralized, but LA in a strange way, yeah. it's very fractured and then it's yeah. extraordinarily wired in. Yeah, but it is, it, more than any other city, there's an interest in its, as, you, as you've mentioned, it's, there's this special interest in its infrastructure and you think of the way it's represented, you know, the kind of fictional life it has that always kind of seems to dwell on I don't know, notions of um, irrigation. <laughs> you know, the yeah, kind of I mean, what you mean, water. Water is water a big system, issue. Here. Yeah, but the, the it's so strange, it, the water thing. Or the police force, or, you know, some sort of district um, administration, you know, that can't, becomes very sort of visible in LA culture in a way that you don't necessarily, that it doesn't at all seem as interesting. In yes. City. So, for example, like Chinatown, you know, the uh, Roman Polanski's movie, you know, the, 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 it's obviously just all around, you know, this relationship between these different elements of LA's infrastructure and how they kind of collide. But then, you know, uh, Mike Davis and his City of Courts, which just basically is a history of LA's infrastructure, isn't it? Essentially, <laughs> you know, but it, again and again, you get these kind of narratives that really kind of become obsessive about, no. and, and you wouldn't have that, it wouldn't be interesting anywhere else. Can you imagine? No, no, I, I agree. I mean, why, why? the reason was how the city was born. Yeah. Or, or how it developed from the 1880s on, because it was tiny before then. I mean, imagine LA, I mean, what was London in 1880? population of maybe 3 million. LA's population was 15,000 yeah. in 1880. And so so the, the city was, was, shall we say, um, shepherded through by an oligarchy of maybe 100 men. And they were obsessed with infrastructure all the time. You couldn't take, you couldn't let your money leave if you brought money in from out of town, especially if you were Jewish or something like that. Or, mm -hmm. or looked wrong or came from New York, they were worried. They didn't trust the movie industry at all for, for that reason, for example. And they, they, they put up aqueducts and harbors and bridges and, and racetracks, and they rebuilt downtown from scratch and so on. And so in, in, uh, they, they made infrastructure very, very personal. <laughs> very, not, not impersonal at all. 
if it kind of quite um uh yeah um eccentric infrastructure or yeah very very much sort of personality driven in the and what's left of it is also like a sort of weird ghost so you know the work that you've done around you know the tram system for example that has long since disappeared but has yes. left its traces with tunnels and stairways and things it's you know there's something about this afterlife of infrastructure as well that's quite interesting yes absolutely i mean and and i mean in in europe they have some of that also right because of the wars right yeah, but because of these, these kinds of level, um, things that were built in world war ii that you can't knock down but, but this we is to, uh, in London, in LA. yeah but in london there used to be trams but no one no one's that interested in finding out where the trams were particularly or trying to reimagine what it was yes. like somehow in la it's this sort of weird fantasy of uh public transport that once existed exactly. isn't it? well On when they tore way. down the system which was something like 1100 miles of track that the whole parts of the city was simply left orphaned it was it was very very crucial la really was a a, 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 a trolley city and it, and then the freeways came in and they changed the nature of it dramatically and also it was so dirty and weird i mean to tear down a system that big i mean that system was as big as london's by far that system was as big as New York's. It was, it was, I think at one point, the biggest in the world. And to tear it down completely, I mean, you really have to think about it. I mean, London lost its trams. New York had trolleys too. I mean, uh, I remember as a baby, only one memory of my first year of life was I could hear the buzz of the trolley wires next to my crib. Mm -hmm. Bzz, I don't know why I remember that. That's all I remember of the first year of my what life. Was what was that in New York? Yes, in Brooklyn. In Brooklyn, yeah. Um, and, um, you know, the, 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 there were trolleys in Brooklyn. There were yeah. trolleys everywhere. There were 36 trolley systems in California, and none of them seemed to matter, except the L.A. story, <laughs> which, which is, uh, they make movies about it and so on. There, there's something about how important they felt the trolleys were, that the infrastructure was part of the, pr the pride, right, of the city. So when it went... You know, when the river no longer works, it's a very big deal for LA to figure out emotionally what to do with their river because they, they destroyed their river and people can barely find it. Um, and other cities have had problems like that. No one talks about the Chicago River uh, sometimes not being noticed or whatever. So I, I understand what you mean. That in LA, it's, it has a very uh, important meaning. It's part of the adventure of the city and the weirdness of the city, they shoot movies. How many movies in London were shot uh, in, in, in abandoned roads and old trolley systems and so on? In LA, they're always going back to, to uh, places there's one, there's they used one, to be. One, I suppose, that stands out, and that's the, the Lady Killers, you know, that's shot in yes. King's Cross. Um, and now King's Cross, obviously, is completely different. And that is fascinating to watch that if you're familiar with King's Cross now. Wow. No, I didn't. I, I, I love the Lady Killers. And, and, you know, I met the man. He set up the film, film program at CalArts. That's a director. lot about infrastructure because it shows the railway, uh, but it also shows the railway houses and the, the kind of sidings and all this kind of thing, um, which is, and there, I think it shows steam trains, doesn't it? Because that's part of the end of the film. Um, yes, all we, this, we, they fall down on it. Oh, yes, yeah, it's, it's all completely gone. So there's a, there are moments for sure, but nothing like what you have with the representations of LA. No, no. I mean, uh, it, it was a scandal. I mean, yeah. mid-century modernism in LA um, went overboard, put it that way. It tore down so many things that didn't have to. Uh, mid-century modernism everywhere is a mess. It turns out we don't like the roads it made. We don't like those blocky chop chop a block buildings we don't we don't like the fact that, that they separated in the mixed use the stores are not near where you live we don't like the whole suburban madness of it we don't like the kind of roads in the scale we want it more intimate and friendly we want we want homemade beer we want <laughs> i i understand i understand all that but la really 
um, was scandalous. I mean, they, they, they smogged up the city, they, 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 they um, violated so, so much of it. Um, and now it turns out people want the older. The, the definition of LA is if you have a street that looks like the freeways never came there yet, your houses are worth twice as much. So, <laughs> so people want to live before that happened. Right. And, and there is this, this myth, at least, that there was some kind of civility about it. Um, and I, I don't know if any other city is quite as obsessed as this. I mean, no, but it's also this image of freedom. I mean, you, you're always telling me about all these English academics that you meet over there that go out to rediscover themselves, you know, and I, yes. I think of a few as well, you know, but, um, and probably also artists too. There's this, oh, is this yes. place of a kind of rediscovery, openness, experimentation, and you see that with the architecture and the amount of architects I've talked to that say, oh, well, I take all my students to LA because that's the place where people can do things without worrying about planning restrictions, you know, as if no one there really cares what's built, you know, you can build, you can get away with building anything. Um, and out of that, something amazing happens. Um, I, and that, that, that's a bit of a myth. For example, yeah, the neighborhood I live in, the entire area has design control. Yeah. And uh, maybe that's why people don't want to put up buildings there. But um, maybe, maybe this goes back to the 50s and 60s. I don't know when. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It does. I mean, LA, you might say, was the first China. Right. <laughs> In terms of the, the speed that, that it was just dropping, dropping bricks or putting, or, or putting up stucco houses. In the 20s, it was laying bricks as fast as New York, even though it was only about one-fifth the size. And, in, and uh, it, it's in the 50s and 60s, the GI Bill generated instant cities. They built one city of 30,000 people in, in three months. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the it's called Lakewood, and there's all kinds of famous stories about how it happened. In fact, the Life magazine wanted to track it because the speed of it was just so weird. It's way, it's right near Orange County, further south. And they hired a man who, I forget his name, but he's, he's a very gifted photographer. And one of his special gifts was that he had film, photographed the aerial bombing of Germany. So he, he shot the building of Lakewood as if it was being bombed in reverse. Yeah. And so the aerial photography of Lakewood is similar to the aerial photography of the um, carpet bombing of Germany. Wow. And, uh, and, and then they had a factory in the middle, which is also typical of a lot of LA suburbs that they were built near factories. It wasn't always true, but it was off, often enough true. So they were, that's a very funny category, you know, if you have a okay. suburb that has a factory in the middle, it sort of doesn't sound like it's a suburb, it's something else, you know, yeah. a factory town or something. And, and the city had its, had its own history and they put the speed of, of how it happened this, was, was extraordinary. So, I mean, LA absorbed um, hundreds of square miles in, in the sprawl, but some of them were actually towns also that had some Funny history, like, like, like farm towns that get swallowed up by suburban spread. Then, but um, it, it somehow people, set the mold that LA was the ultimate, right? Yeah. Century modern city. And maybe it was. I, well, architects would go there, wouldn't they, to make a career? I'm not. Oh, uh, yeah. I'm not sure if artists would. Would yes. artists go to LA? Well, the, the art I mean, scene. Artists, in the 1970s, uh, the art scene in LA begins to become important internationally, right? Like Rainer Banham uh, goes and lives in Venice, and he was this important uh, art critic and a pop art critic even yeah, in before, London. Before apologies. Yes, which is going to have its 50th anniversary. And he yeah. makes this film uh, with, with this, this scratchy beard. Have you, seen, have you seen, is that the film? I mean, I'm yeah. sure- Rainer Benham loves Los Angeles. He comes, yeah, he comes over from London and he hires a car. Yeah, and yeah, and, and, he, uh, and, and then uh, Venturi always said that he should have called it Learning from Los Angeles because no one else ever, ever hired him to build anything after that book, but, but LA people. So, I mean, LA did have this, this laboratory feeling up to a point. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not as convinced it's as true anymore. <laughs> I mean, I, I think the Asian cities have more, are more willing to do that. 
or cities in in the Middle East, right? The, the, like the, the Dubai phenomenon. But um, uh, LA was was very interested in image and and an outside in way of looking at itself. Any city that's that is involved in that is going to allow architects a lot more room. And LA was careless about uh, the, the the breadth of its space. But LA is now densified, so it's less clear that that's going to happen. People are retrofitting buildings more. Do you know what I mean? They're taking an old building and and and, and putting some, a new custard on top or something like that. That obsession with all the case studies, you know, that also features. Yes, that was that was right right after World War Two, right during that period. Shulman made the case study houses. It's very strange, you know. Yeah. But you know, they did something like that in Stuttgart too. Gropius uh, and, and friends built this, this housing complex that was almost like a case study experiment. And no one talks about, ah, oh, Stuttgart. <laughs> <laughs> it's because- It doesn't, it doesn't trip out, slip out of the tongue, you know, Stuttgart, oh my God. You know, so, so, so it wasn't like LA was the only place that would allow these smaller units to be built by a coterie of young architects, um, but uh, and uh, uh, the, the whole photography of it was very strange, yeah. um, because it, it 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 looked so gaudy. It looked almost like the uh, like like the opening shot in Heat or something, where where Robert De Niro one of the opening shots. Robert De Niro is looking from his apartment and he's getting this this diamonds on black velvet look of the city and so on. And this this whole image that one with, with these things, and, and like the, the man who photographed them uh, said he didn't care what, 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 what the city was, he only knew what the shot had to be, and he knew what the architect dreamt of, and he gave them their dream. Mm -hmm. So the, even the photographs have become so strange that people would actually go around with, with the photographs to real estate brokers and say, how much would one of these cost? <laughs> Did, it, did Amanda did Amanda ever tell you about meeting Julius Shulman? Oh no, no. I, I I worked with him for a while. He was one tough character. What did she say? Oh yeah, she said something similar. I think it was she met him not long before he died, and I don't know. I think he. Oh God, I'm trying to remember the story now. She has got a really good story about being put on the spot where they're in his office and he kind of has a, a photograph on the wall. Uh, it's just one of the, his standard kind of <laughs> modernist buildings. Yes. And he says to her, what do you see? What do you see? And she goes like, mm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. It's, it's some kind of double meaning. She's like, uh, money? <laughs> money? She said that? Yeah. Well, she's not wrong. He made a lot of money for people. Yeah. Um, he, he, he was a thorny kind of character, but I'm not sure got him started on his photo career, actually. And- um, So what were you doing with, uh, what were, how, how were you working with him? Newman? Yeah. Well, I was doing a project called Bleeding Through, which yeah. is coming out in a new edition this year. Um, and it was, it was a, a kind of photo project as a novel about Los Angeles. And um, I, I, I interviewed him and I looked at his photographs and also he grew up in Boyle Heights. And I wanted Boyle Heights to be part of the story. I remember asking him about the Zoot Suit riots and he just looked up at me and he said, oh, that was nothing. That was the largest uprising of that, of the whole Second World War is nothing. <clears throat> and, uh, then I, 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 I asked him if I could, you, if he would do me the, the honor of allowing me to include one of his photographs in the project as a matter of respect because of how important he is. And he said, how much money you have? Yeah. I said, no, no, this is, this is done through Germany and USC. I don't have money. He said, you have money. You're hiding it. Oh, really? I said, I saw, so, so then I took the interview with him and I just said, a man who grew up in Boyle Heights. I didn't even mention he was an architect. <laughs> it seemed he didn't want to be an architect. He was just a guy who was a kid in Boyle Heights. You know? But I, I was at his studio and, uh, he had everything organized. He even had a phone record going back 40 years of each phone call he made. And everything was sorted out. He was, he was building 
his own pyramid. He was like the Pharaoh building his pyramid while he was there, you know. It's almost like Rivera's museum, if you see one in Mexico City. Like, like, like Picasso's like collection. Very, very strange sense of, of eternity about it. And yeah. He was a tough well, character. I, I, Maybe he had to be. I don't know. Have that. They have this sense of um, legacy, you know, they're building their own sort of mythology uh, through keeping every single detail. There's that story about Picasso keeping his toenails, isn't there? In, Is that true? Yeah. Oh you my know, God. When he cut yeah, his well, toenails, he knew it was valuable. Okay. Isn't, there, isn't there also this story that Picasso <laughs> wanted to get some kind of castle or something in, in, out, out in the countryside yeah. and they couldn't decide on a price and finally they said that he could have the castle if he could draw it. So he made a drawing of the castle and that was a fair exchange. I don't know if that story is true or not, but he was almost that famous. Wow. People would send him checks and hope that he would sign the back of the check. I mean, this doesn't happen but once in a hundred years, right? Picasso's um, colossal importance has warped the reality of so many artists. You know, I mean, uh, I know it's, it's got a, that that story's got a lot to answer for. Yeah, yeah. yeah. A lot, a lot of bad art has come. We're out. both dealing with young artists who don't understand that it's not that it was never quite true, and it's definitely no longer true, right? I get over it. <laughs> um, but listen, Norman, we should probably finish it because we're trying to keep these quite short, aren't we? And yeah, well, well is, wanna, is it going in a direction you like? Yeah, I like I like the direction, and I, you know, we we started with the police, and we've moved on to other things. Um, yes, yeah, but 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 the the, the, end, the end of the story is that the big crisis for America is going to be that the infrastructure, the job situation, and the political constitutional facts of life are all merging, and a lot of it can be seen inside the life of the city, of cities themselves. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a powerful drama. The world is vaguely fascinated. And mostly what I get sense from, from Europe when people talking about it is they feel slightly sorry for me and they're so glad that they're not going through it. <laughs> yeah, I think that's about right. But listen, what, what I do next time maybe is um, I'll spring another kind of general theme or, yes. or area on you. I won't, I won't give you any warning and then we can start with that yes. and see where, see where it takes you. That's, that's perfect. 